Well, on this second Sunday of Advent, we're not going to have a homily. We're going to have a, well, not really a homily. We're going to have a sermon. A little bit different. If you remember last week, we kind of focused on the reading, which is a homily. Uh, this is a sermon. A sermon is more uh, topical in, in nature. And on this second Sunday of, said, uh, of Advent, we focus on peace. As we've heard in our uh, hymns and we've heard in our candle, uh, Advent candle lighting liturgy. I want to start with um, just a short quote from the Song of Zechariah To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. To guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace is the reality of the very kingdom of God. We begin our Christian journey understanding that we are separated from God, which happened in the past, in the fall of humanity. And we begin our Christian journey understanding that our soul seeks an inner peace. That peace we find will only come from the Holy Spirit working from within us, which starts at our holy baptism. Yes, the Holy Spirit works outside of all persons, but comes to reside within that holy baptism. And we come to know in our journey of maturation in the church, that the separation from God is dealt with once and for all in Christ Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And as we mature in Christ, we learn how to pray, we learn how to pray constantly, we read and study the Holy Scriptures, we seek a spiritual mentor, and we nurture our soul through the sacramental life in the church. As one saint wrote, we experience this sacramental way of life as the spiritual medicine that brings God's grace, Christ himself and the Holy Spirit, to grow within us. The spiritual power warms our heart, purifies the soul, brings us into closer relationship with God, and develops an unshakable inner peace. We discover that this is that this is the peace that is not disturbed by the trials and tribulations of our earthly life. So we see here that the peace of this age, the peace of this world, is not the same as the peace that one receives with the Holy Spirit living within. And the faithful church live in Christ's peace and experience Christ's peace. If we remember Jesus' prayer, read it in St. John's Gospel, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, so the, through the cross of Christ, all humanity becomes what we are created to be in the beginning, one body, one humanity, at peace with God, peace with creation, including one another. And the cross of Christ brings all hostility to an end, since all humans have access in one spirit to God the Father. The issue is, is not all persons accept this. Not all persons live this. Christ makes us one body, the body of one Christ through one spirit, through one God and Father. So the reality of peace is that we are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens and members of the household of God. But remember, this is through receiving the Holy Spirit in baptism and in 
the sacramental life of the church. So Christ is the content of the peace, the source of the peace, the bringer of peace, and the faithful church are the recipients of this gift of peace from God. And again, this is not the peace of this world. Jesus says, I give you not as the world gives you. So as faithful recipients of the gift of the peace of God in Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit residing in the church in baptism, the church desperately and overwhelmingly and joyfully look forward to when God's peace will rule and reign all in all. That's his promise when he is with us. All will be at peace. So we look forward to his second advent his return in glory. The church looks forward for that age to come, the one we pray for, thy kingdom come, where total peace will reign, where the lion and the lamb lie down together, where people will beat their swords into plowshares and practice war no more. Peace will reign on the renewed heavens and the new earth. And the Prince of Peace, the King of Peace, will reign forever and ever. For indeed, he is the source of all true peace. What would he do until that day comes upon us? Well, the faithful church is called to cooperate with the Holy Spirit within by saying yes to God, to be in the world, but not of the world, by choosing to be the presence of God's peace that passes all understanding in the world. We humans are made in the image and likeness of God, and humans have a choice. The choice of the church is faith, good works, baptism, repentance, confession, loving in a humble, peacemaking manner, being made more and more as we are willing, to be made more and more by the Holy Spirit, that which Christ is. And embodied in each true believer in their own life, the peace of God is then offered to the world in our own unique way, in our own unique sphere of influence as God brings before us. <clears throat> so in this, the church is tasked with an ongoing call to be living peace, to be bringing the peace of Christ for all the church is to struggle to be at peace, to be in peace, to be full of peace, to witness to the covenant of peace, to live the way of peace, proclaim the gospel of peace, to be persons of peace, to be children of peace, and to be in Christ, makers of peace on this earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. So the faithful church are those through holy baptism, and through the sacraments of the church, and by all the other means, study, spiritual direction, speaking and, and uplifting our brothers and sisters in Christ, and always choosing to draw closer in union and communion with God. The church realized that God's kindness and goodness in the person of Christ contains the reality of peace on earth and goodwill to all, which is what the angels rang out at his birth. And every person who wants to truly be fully human, as Christ is fully human, will want to be at peace and in peace 
to have that inner peace, to have that personal peace, social peace, cosmic peace, peace pervading the whole of God's creation, knowing that this will be so fully so only at Christ's return. The Holy Spirit declares all enemies of God must be put under the feet of Christ Jesus. And that last enemy is death itself. And then Christ will offer all things to the Father. And then God will be all in all. And the peace of God will reign throughout the whole of creation. Those that are his, those that are sh the sheep and not the goats, will receive this as the most blessed, glorious paradise. And those that choose against Christ and choose themselves first will receive this reality as the opposite of paradise. But that comes at the end of the age. And we must remember the twin themes of Advent as we prepare for the arrival of Christ at the end of the age, or we celebrate again in this year of our Lord, 2021, the anniversary of his birth. But the church must be clear through that the peace at the end of the age will come, total peace. And this peace will not simply be an absence of conflict, an absence of war, an absence of military action, not merely the absence of strife. This eternal peace is the full presence of God, filling all and all, that no one will escape and no one will stand against for all eternity, which is the divine life of God in the midst of the faithful church. You will no longer leave the sun and the moon, for Christ will be in your midst and will be your light. Again, until that day arrives, Christ Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. The church are to be the presence of God's mercy and kindness, the presence of God's love, truth, the presence of God's wisdom and knowledge, because as the scripture reminds us, the fool knows no peace. Wisdom and peace go hand in hand. The church are to embody as Christ Jesus all of the qualities, all of the characteristics, all of the virtues of God. And at the heart of all these is peace driven by the eternal, selfless love of God. And if the church are not people of peace, then we're part of the troubles of this age. Therefore, to be the presence of Christ's peace, to be those that struggle to bring peace, means to be at peace within ourselves, not divided internally, not being of this world, but still being in this world. Not serving mammon, but serving God. Not divided internally, but united internally by the Holy Spirit, and united externally by the Holy Spirit of the living God. That all of our humanity, our body, our soul, our will, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our emotions must all be at peace, filled with the peace of Christ. Well, is that going to happen today? I don't think so. It's a lifelong process. You don't just all of a sudden pop up and become completely full of peace in all things and at all times. That's not the way it works. It's not saying that God could grant that to somebody, but Usually that's not the way it works for the saints. It's a process. But if we don't get into that process, by faith, by worship, 
by all of the means that the church gives us, prayer, fasting, reading of the scriptures, visiting the poor, helping the widow, whatever it might be. If we don't get into that, if we don't do that, Jesus said even a cup of water doesn't go unnoticed in the kingdom of God. If we're not doing that, then we're part of the animosity, we're part of the enmity, we're part of the envy, we're part of the coveting and consuming that we see in the worldly. But peace comes from within. The kingdom of God is within you, Christ Jesus said. That peace comes from within, and that peace is a gift from God the Holy Spirit, if we're willing. A gift from the Holy Spirit, even at baptism. And then we can do whatever we want with that gift. We can forget about it, or we can nurture that. We can live that gift of peace that cannot be given from this world. It's not the peace of Rome. It's not the peace of peace treaties. It's the peace of God that is not of this world. Well, again, who can be humble of heart and who can be pure in heart and who can be peace making and peacekeeping all the time? Who can be suffering for righteousness sake and be merciful and hopeful too every hour of every day? Who can bless those that curse them and pray for those who mistreat them every moment of every day? Who can love their enemies and share what they have and love with that peaceful, self-sacrificial love of God each and every hour of every day? Well, perhaps we could turn to Christ Jesus. See what he has to say. It's always a good place to start, I think. Well, I hear in this world, just keep trying harder. Keep pushing. Try harder. By your own willpower, you can get better. It's your own willpower. You can make anything happen. You can be anything that you want to be. Well, I've talked to a few people that have tried to live that way. And the outcome is generally the same. Christ Jesus never did say, try harder. He never did say, go on your own willpower and you can create whatever your heart's desire might be. Rather, he said some very strange words. Without me, you can do nothing. What does that mean? Nothing can happen without me? No, what he means is you can do nothing of lasting eternal significance without me, without the Holy Spirit, without cooperating with, without op opening your life and your will, your words and your deeds and your actions to God and for God. St. Peter was troubled by this. I've mentioned this many times when I bear saying again. He was troubled by all of this living humbly and peaceably and lovingly every moment of every day. And Christ Jesus agreed with him. But he reminds Peter and all humanity that with human beings, this way of living is impossible. We're not in and of ourselves able to live the pure life and humble, loving, and peaceful reality of God's kingdom. Otherwise, Christ is a fool and a joke and simply not needed. But the church believes otherwise. And the church believes that with God first, not me first, everything does become possible according to God's will, not mine. And that's the big one. You can be anything you want. If you were to add according to God's will, I'd be right there with you every step of the way. Because 
God first and not me first. Knowing that everything does become possible according to God's will opens the door that one can even be at peace and bring peace in this so often warped and distorted world. To be a peaceful person in troubled churches where the people and the leaders are not at peace. To bring peace to our own inner self is created in the image and likeness of God. And to the measure that we humble ourselves and become peace as he is peace by way of the spirit of peace, the Holy Spirit. To the measure that we are at peace, we bring peace to others. We bring peace to the nations. We bring peace to the world. The faithful church are to be at peace because the faithful church trusts God. They trust that his kingdom of peace is coming fully at the end of the age, and we wait. But we wait patiently and actively. So the church actualizes the kingdom of peace on earth to the fullness that God enables each one of us which is to the extent that we are willing and humble and pure of heart and repentant, choosing the Lord our God first. O Lord, you have given your church as a refuge of peace in a hostile and dark world. May this parish really be your community of peace. May the parishioners be persons of peace. May we not need mind-numbing substances. May we not need wealth. May we not need power to stay and remain at peace. O Christ, who is our peace, let us be peace with you and in you, bearers of your peace in ourselves, together as communities of faith witnessing to you that peace that passes all understanding. Yes, this second Sunday of Advent, this Advent Sunday of peace. And also through this Advent season and unto ages of ages. Amen.